What's up, everyone? Welcome back again. We are finally here after months of breaking down prospects, discussing team fits, and reevaluating basically everything after the bombshells of free agency. We are here. It's time to do a mock draft. So here's how this is going to work. I'm not going to be trying to predict what each team will pick. That's virtually impossible to do for one because of trades. And secondly, because every team is working off their own draft boards and they all value players differently. So what I'm going to do is try to draft for each team as if I was their general manager. I will take my own grades on players into account. I will draft based on schemes they currently employ because not every player fits every scheme. And I'll draft with the cap and free agency also in mind for future seasons like a real general manager would. To me, doing it this way is better because even if only a handful of my picks are correct, that doesn't really matter to me. What does matter to me is that I can go back to this mock draft in a year or two years or five years and see how my personal decisions stack up with the decisions that are actually made. It's easier for me to see who was more right or more wrong about a player if I'm drafting with my own gut rather than trying to guess the guts of 32 other people and what they're going to do. And of course, for each pick in this mock, I'll be breaking it down with full game film and full reasoning to try to help you guys get where I'm coming from with all these guys. So with that, let's start drafting. With the first overall pick of the first annual film room mock draft special, I'm going with Miles Garrett to the Cleveland Browns. This is pretty much the only consensus pick in any mock draft that you're going to find this year, and for good reason. He's a franchise pass rusher that is coming into a league that requires franchise pass rushers for success. He's got an incredible combination of burst, lateral agility, bulk, arm length, and of course a completely unfair level of fluidity for a guy his size. Out of all the freakish defensive ends that come out of college and go in the top two picks in recent years, Jadavian Clowney, Mario Williams, even going back to Julius Peppers, Garrett is easily the most flexible of the bunch. Players with his height and bulk just do not normally bend as well as he does. And when you combine that bend with his length and first step, I mean, this is the kind of edge rusher that can compete for the league lead in sacks every single season. He's that special. And in the absence of a true slam dunk franchise quarterback coming out of this draft class, getting a player that can hunt down franchise quarterbacks is a pretty good consolation prize. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this pick because everyone already knows who's going number one. But I did want to reinforce the fact that, yes, Garrett is worth this pick. And I would have to be really dumb to pass up the opportunity to get him. And that brings us to the San Francisco 49ers at number two overall. We're going from the easiest pick in the first round to, in my opinion, the hardest. Like, I'm not even kidding. This was hands down the hardest pick to make in this mock draft. And the difficulty of it was primarily caused by the Niners being insistent that Jimmy Ward is going to be making the move to free safety, despite the fact that he was their best cornerback in 2016. I was all ready to slot Malik Hooker into the spot to be their free safety of the future, but that looks like it's probably not a realistic situation anymore. If the team is really committed to having Jimmy Ward switch positions, then I have to kind of pivot my board a bit as their general manager. That being said, this is the number two overall pick for a roster that is one of the most talent starved in the league. This pick needs to hit. It cannot miss. Period. I cannot take any risks here because the team is already a few years away from being a serious competitor and screwing up this opportunity will only make it worse. So my gut's telling me to play it safe and take the surest of sure things in this whole draft. And that is Alabama tight end OJ Howard. And before you say it, I know what you're thinking. What the hell, Brett? He's a tight end. You don't take tight ends in the top two picks. But I think only looking at Howard as a tight end is a bit misleading. I did a full long form breakdown on what makes Howard special that you can check out on my channel, kind of get a complete overview of his skill set. But as it relates specifically to San Francisco, to me, as general manager of the Niners, I've got Kyle Shanahan running my offense. He doesn't care if you're a receiver or a running back or a tight end. He only cares if you're a mismatch. That's how his scheme works. He builds around his personnel that he has to work with. And to me, Howard is the best pass catching weapon in this draft class, regardless of the position that he plays. If you are too big for safeties to cover and too fast for linebackers to cover, Shanahan's gonna get you the ball and he's gonna get it to you a lot. Howard is bigger, faster, and quicker than Corey Davis, and he's a more refined route runner than Mike Williams. He's a better in-line blocker than any other tight end in this class not named George Kittle, but Howard also has the benefit of running like a deer and being really tough to bring down after the catch. If you're getting a thousand yards receiving, potentially double-digit touchdowns, and an improved run game all from adding one guy to your team, who cares what position is next to his name on the roster? Production is production, and I think Howard is going to be incredibly productive at the next level. 
He's the best tight end prospect to enter the NFL since Rob Gronkowski, and to be honest, taking Gronk's health concerns into account, which caused him to drop a full round in the draft in the first place, I might actually rate Howard as a better prospect than Gronkowski. And you know what? Ask any Patriots fans if they would still draft Gronk with a top two pick despite his injuries, and I'm sure they'd all say yes in a heartbeat, back surgeries and all. I sure would because I don't care what position is giving me my production on offense as long as that production is still being made. Howard's a beast, straight up. He's worth the pick, so I'm making it. Now, moving on to the third overall pick, we get back to an easy one with Jamal Adams going to the Chicago Bears. And it's interesting because I would put Malik Hooker to the Niners over Jamal Adams, but Jamal Adams to the Bears over Malik Hooker. And here's why. Chicago is in a bad place right now. Jay Cutler is gone, Alshon Jeffrey is gone, their defense suffered multiple devastating injuries last season to the point where it might even affect how well they can perform in this coming season. These are dark times for a storied franchise, and to me the only way to get out of that hole they dug themselves into is to draft a voice. They need to draft a leader that can drag them out of the hole. They need energy, they need ferocity, they just need a human spark. I talked about this in my full individual breakdown of Adams, but when you draft him, you aren't just drafting a player, you're drafting a culture. Chicago is in dire need of an upgrade to their culture. Now it helps that Adams is a freak talent at the position that is blessed with great feet, fluid hips, excellent instincts and ball skills, and of course a willingness to come downhill and tackle against the run. But his fantastic physical skill set is secondary to me because we already know how great he is on the field. We've known how great he is since he played as a true freshman. His biggest value, though, is what he brings off the field. His leadership in the weight room and the film room, the energy he brings to practice every single day. As Bill O'Brien says, he gives your team juice. That's what the Bears need more than anything. They need some friggin' juice. And Jamal Adams can provide that in spades. I can't not take him here. So onto the fourth overall pick, we're staying with LSU and sliding in Leonard Fournette to the Jaguars. I shouted from the hilltops a couple months ago in my full breakdown of Fournette that he was perfect for Jacksonville, and I meant it. Nothing has changed, and he's still perfect for Jacksonville. Fournette can give this offense an identity that does not lean on Blake Bortles to do everything for them. And to be honest, I think that as soon as that weight is lifted off of Bortles' shoulders, he can be a more effective quarterback. Fournette's mere presence will open up the middle of the field for easy completions off of play action. It'll bring safeties down near the line of scrimmage to open up deep shots to Allen Robinson. And I really do think just having a running back that can keep this unit on schedule is all they really need to finally be able to move the ball consistently. The defense was quietly pretty darn good last season with the emergence of Jalen Ramsey, Telvin Smith, and Yannick Ngakwe, but the offense left them out to dry far too often. They played too many snaps on defense, they would get gassed, and that's when the breakdowns happened. Fournette fixes that problem. He controls the clock. He gives Bortles more third and threes rather than third and sevens. And he'll be a ball carrier that keeps his defense fresh and playing as fast as possible. If he's there at fourth overall, I'm running in that card, plain and simple. He helps this team in too many ways for me to pass up here. And with Fournette off the board, that brings me to the Titans at fifth overall. Now, admittedly, as the pretend Titans GM, I'm kind of pissed because I wanted Jamal Adams here, but he is off the board already. I also thought about Malik Hooker because Tennessee does need help in the secondary, but I really do like their young free safety, Kevin Byard. So if I'm gonna upgrade anything, it's not gonna be him. And I don't think that Hooker is a good fit at strong safety across from Byard because that would be asking him to have more responsibilities against the run in the box, which was by far his biggest weak point at Ohio State. I also thought about Hooker's teammate, Marshawn Lattimore, and in the end, it came down to Lattimore and Clemson's Mike Williams. Ultimately though, I chose Williams because my philosophy as a team builder is to find what your strength is and build around it. For the Titans, their strength is unquestionably Marcus Mariota. They have a great offensive line, a great core of running backs of course, and their front seven isn't half bad either. But Mariota is what makes the whole operation work. His accuracy, his efficiency, and his mobility all make him one of the best young quarterbacks in the game. He's definitely developed faster than I ever thought he would, and that's a credit to him, of course. In particular, since he's entered the league, he has been phenomenal in the red zone. In fact, I think he still has yet to throw an interception in the red zone throughout his entire two-year career, which is just nuts. But for all the value that Mariota brings to his team, he's still lacking that true number one wide receiver that can help him take his game and his team to the next level. Enter Mike Williams, the true number one wide receiver that did more for Deshaun Watson's career than any other person. He's not a burner, and he's not a really shifty route runner, but he doesn't need to be. 
He's in that Des Bryant, Alshon Jeffrey kind of mold that wins with catch radius, body control, and ball skills more than speed and quickness. With Mariota being so accurate, they actually complement each other very well because he can consistently put the ball in places where only Williams can get it. So even when he's covered, he won't really be covered. And taking Mariota's red zone accuracy into account with Williams' already dominant presence in the red zone, we can be looking at a 12 plus touchdown kind of receiver here, even as a rookie. That kind of production is worth the top five investment to me, especially because this class is not particularly loaded at wide receiver. Now I've brought up Malik Hooker with a few different teams already and I've kind of been waiting for an opportunity to pick him. So let's just go ahead and end that slide now and put him in New York with the Jets at sixth overall. Gangreen needs a lot of help in the secondary and free safety is no exception. Hooker has the best combination of range, instincts and ball skills in a safety since Earl Thomas seven years ago. And considering the value of a good free safety to a defense that runs mostly cover one or cover three looks, getting a once in every seven or eight year kind of prospect is a huge priority. Hooker's presence in center field immediately makes that defense better. It takes away almost all hope of completing any passes downfield in the seams and restricts quarterbacks to trying to fit the ball into extremely tight windows on the boundaries instead. Even the mighty Clemson offense did not test Hooker over the middle despite the fact that they had Deshaun Watson and five future NFL pass catchers working downfield. Hell, even when they were only exclusively working the boundaries to stay away from Hooker, he still had the range and ball skills to get an interception anyway. That's how special he is. Even if you try to avoid him, he can still get you because he's just too fast and too instinctive. So Hooker is the dream free safety prospect in this class. The Jets need a free safety. This makes too much sense not to do. At number seven, I'll stick with the Ohio State secondary and draft Marshawn Lattimore to the now Los Angeles Chargers. The Chargers already have two good corners in Jason Verrett and Casey Hayward, but I'm not a fan of their depth after those two, and Verrett does have a tendency to get injured. Plus, Gus Bradley is switching up the Chargers defensive scheme with him being hired on as the defensive coordinator, and he tends to favor more press and press bail oriented corners. Verrett and Hayward are obviously very good, but they are true off cover corners that don't tend to do as well in press. So it would make sense for them to take Lattimore, who is a press and press bail corner through and through. He fits the scheme, he gives them depth at a premium position of need, and he is easily a top 10 type of talent. In fact, I briefly considered him at number two overall to the 49ers, but with Lattimore's history of soft tissue injuries, I was a little bit hesitant to pull the trigger on drafting him until I absolutely had to. And when it comes to the Chargers, I absolutely had to. Talent wise and scheme wise, he's a perfect fit. They just need to do their best to keep him healthy and on the field. Because if he does stay on the field and he does stay healthy, he can combine with Verrett and Hayward to give LA arguably the best young corner trio in the National Football League. That's the kind of ceiling we're talking about here. All right, moving on to number eight and the Panthers. I'm going with Solomon Thomas from Stanford. I banged the table for Malik McDowell to Carolina for a long time. And to be fair, I do think it can still happen. But McDowell weighed in during the combine at a biscuit under 300 pounds, which was more than even I was expecting. And that's fine in its own right. I mean, he moved very well at that weight. But being that bulky really screams more five technique defensive end in a 3-4 than it does 4-3 defensive end to me. Solomon Thomas, though, is built exactly how you want a base end in a 4-3 to be built. He's not nearly as long or as strong as McDowell, and I do not advise playing him inside at all because he doesn't anchor very well and he does get blown off the ball by double teams, but he does have a killer first step off the snap. He's got great hands, he's got bend and lateral agility, and his motor never stops running. He has all the qualities you want in a traditional 4-3 defensive end except length. But when looking at his total physical skill set, he should be able to make it work and be a very productive edge rusher in the NFL. Like I said, just don't expect him to be that dominant physical presence inside that can reset the line of scrimmage and stuff the run against a double team. He does just fine when he's only got to deal with one block in front of him. He can stack, shed, and penetrate into the backfield. But anchoring against that down block from the side while stacking on someone in front of him, that's just not his strong suit. He needs to be exclusively out on the edges and trying to get around that corner where there's more one-on-one -on -one situations that he can win. Think of him like a bit longer but slightly less fluid version of Everson Griffin. And you know what? If he ends up being as productive as Everson Griffin is in Minnesota, this will be an eighth overall pick well spent. Now, this ninth pick was tough. It took a lot of thought, and I ended up selecting Corey Davis out of Western Michigan after considering several other fits for this spot as well. This pick was hard because I do think that I reached a little bit to take Davis based off of where he's placed on my own board, but out of all the guys that I have ahead of him on my board, none of them really fit what Cincinnati needs like Davis does. 
so consider Davis to be the best player available among the players that I could see the Bengals actually taking here. And I could see the Bengals taking Davis because at the end of the day, they will only go as far as Andy Dalton takes them. So my job as GM is to make sure that Dalton can be as successful as possible because that's the only way to make sure our team is successful as possible. Throughout Dalton's career, he's always been at his best when he's in three wide receiver sets, when the defense is spread out and he can just distribute the ball all over the field. Davis, along with obviously AJ Green and Tyler Boyd, would give the Bengals back that three-headed monster at receiver that they used to have before Mo Sanu and Marvin Jones left in free agency. Davis is not the fastest or the most explosive receiver out there. In fact, I'd venture to say that he's not really explosive at all, but he's got great hands, is a terrific route runner, and he can be a very high-end number two receiver in the NFL for a long time. To me, he's very comparable to Anquan Bolden, though a little bit better after the catch than Bolden ever was. To be honest, you could almost say that Corey Davis is what people hoped Laquan Treadwell would develop into eventually, but Davis is already there. He is a day one out of the box contributor for an offense that just desperately needs one. So I'm okay with reaching a little bit here because at the end of the day, my job is to make Andy Dalton's life easier and Davis does that. Rounding out the top 10 is the Buffalo Bills who suddenly find themselves in need of an outside linebacker after Zach Brown just bolted in free agency and there just so happens to be a really damn good one still on the board in Reuben Foster from Alabama. Foster combined with current Bills linebacker Reggie Ragland to form one of the best tandems in Bama history, a tandem that won a national championship by the way, and I think he would do well to reunite with him up in Buffalo. They complement each other's skill sets perfectly, with Ragland playing the prototypical stack and shed middle linebacker, while Foster plays the fast, aggressive, attacking weak side linebacker role that can make plays in space and clean up the edges while running free. He's not the best at taking on blocks and shedding up at the point of attack, but with Raglan and other former Tide defender Marcel Darius in front of him, he shouldn't have to take on a ton of blocks at the point. He'll be able to just run clean and play as fast and loose as possible. That's the style of play that really fits him the best, which means the Bills are one of the situations that fit him the best. He'll be great up there. Pick number 11 now, and the New Orleans Saints are on the clock. And I really do like Gary and Conley from Ohio State here. And I'll tell you what, I, this pick is really more out of frustration than anything else because I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of hearing, oh, the Saints secondary is fine, they just keep getting injured, so we don't get to see if they really need a corner or not because they're playing backups all the time and blah, 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 blah. I'm sick of it, okay? I'm absolutely sick of it. Delvin Bro cannot stay on the field, and neither can PJ Williams or Damian Swan. You know how many games Williams and Swan have combined been healthy for the last two years? Eight and a half, together between the two of them. That's just not gonna cut it, regardless of how talented they are. The most important ability for a player is availability, and as a group, they just have not been available. So in comes Conley, who is more talented than the whole bunch anyway. He's a terrific athlete, he's explosive, he's got long speed, his footwork and hips are very clean, and he's got the ball skills you look for as well. Really, his only major flaw is that his hand usage is essentially non-existent, which leads to some easy completions that probably should not be allowed but that is a very coachable flaw and should be ironed out fairly quickly once he's in the pros. Conley has the potential to be a number one corner in the NFL from the moment he enters the building. And honestly, even if Bro or Williams or Swan are all healthy, I think Conley would start over any of them anyway. You can of course check out my full breakdown on Conley's skill set on my channel to get a better idea of what you're getting there. But in short, he's a legit top 15 pick and I'd bet that he makes multiple Pro Bowls throughout his career, provided that he fixes that ugly hand usage. It's time to actually get a Pro Bowl caliber defensive back in New Orleans that can really stay on the field. Okay, no more waiting. All right, I'm done. Conley's the guy. Now on to pick 12 and the return of the Cleveland Browns to this mock draft. I'll cut to the chase here because I know a lot of people are probably going to hate this pick, but I'm going with Eddie Jackson, free safety from Alabama. He is, at least to me, a severely, severely underrated player. In any normal safety class, I think he'd be seen as the best pure free safety prospect, but he just happens to share this class with Malik Hooker, so he's been kind of forgotten about. He was also forgotten about because he missed the final half of the season with a broken leg, so just as Hooker and Buda Baker and Obi Melifonwu all started to get high first round attention, Jackson just kind of faded into obscurity as he went into physical therapy. But here's the short version of my thoughts on Jackson when he actually was on the field, which is what really matters here more than anything else. He's basically a slightly discounted version of Malik Hooker. He's got legit 4-4 speed. As a former corner, he's got better footwork and better hips than your average safety. And his background as a high school wide receiver really shows up in his ball skills. And not only that, but he's an excellent return man that routinely flips the field on special teams. And that return ability carries over to when he's on defense and returning interceptions as well. 
Simply put, he is extremely dangerous when the ball is in his hands. So not only can he get you turnovers, but he can get you points as well. And believe me, he will get his hands on the ball and he will get you points. You look at his range when playing in deep zones and he has zero issues getting from hash to hash. Whether he's tracking a deep ball or returning a punt or running down a ball carrier from behind, it doesn't take a whole lot of tape watching to see that he can really, really run. As the fake general manager of the Browns, I have two priorities right now when trying to fix this defense. Get the quarterback and get the ball. I just drafted Miles Garrett to get the quarterback and I'm drafting Eddie Jackson to get the ball. That's his one job. Is he a dominant presence against the run? Absolutely not. He's really more of a finesse tackler and he does take some really terrible angles in the run game at times. But with the role that he's gonna be playing in this defense, I honestly really don't care about that. I'm not paying him to stop the run. That's what I have Danny Shelton and Jamie Collins and Christian Kirksey for. I'm paying Eddie Jackson to take away the deep seams in the pass game, go get interceptions, and flip the field with his awesome return ability. That's it. He's the kind of safety that can give a shaky young quarterback like Cody Kessler a few extra possessions to put some points on the board. And if that shaky young quarterback can't get it done, Jackson has the potential to just put points on the board himself. That's his value to me. Stop the deep ball, give the offense more possessions, and improve average field position on special teams. If you can get those three things for your football team all from one player, it's worth the investment of a top 12 pick. Now for pick 13 in the Arizona Cardinals, I'm taking a totally different approach. And rather than trying to build a team that will be more forgiving for a young quarterback, I'm drafting a young quarterback for a team that has the ability to be forgiving for him. Deshaun Kaiser from Notre Dame is my guy here, and I can already hear Browns fans trying to figure out why I'm mocking a quarterback literally one pick after them when they also need a new quarterback. And it's basically because I know that in Arizona, there's very little chance that Kaiser will actually have to see the field as a rookie. Whereas in Cleveland, it would be almost guaranteed that he sees the field. And I just don't think he's ready to play right now. He needs to sit a year on the bench, learn from an established veteran, and just kind of marinate while he adjusts to the NFL. He can get that in Arizona as a third string backup to Carson Palmer while he makes one last playoff run, but he's definitely not going to get that luxury as a backup to Cody Kessler in Cleveland. It would not be good for Kaiser to throw him out too early, and it wouldn't be good for the Browns either. So I really do think that the Cardinals are the best fit for him, both from a player and a team perspective. Now, as for what he brings to the table, Kaiser has as impressive a physical skill set as you'll see in this class. He's got a whip for an arm, he's mobile enough to be a threat with his legs when the play breaks down, and he's got great size and big hands. I mean, if you're drawing up what you want a quarterback to look like, it would look like Kaiser. He also comes from an offense with a lot of pro style concepts, he picks up terminology quickly on the whiteboard, and I don't really have any concerns with him digesting a pro playbook and understanding all the concepts from day one. His pocket presence and feel for pressure is also usually pretty good, and he's shown in the past that he can work through progressions and read the full field. However, my main gripe with him, and the reason why I do not feel that he's anywhere near ready to start, is that he is maddeningly inconsistent. You like the tools and you like his ability to digest a playbook, but on the field he's a bit of a roller coaster ride right now. One moment he'll step up in the pocket and deliver the prettiest pass downfield you'll ever see, and he'll fit the ball into NFL sized windows. And then the next moment, he'll either put one in the dirt or put one in the bleachers. His footwork and overall throwing mechanics were just way too inconsistent, which led to his accuracy being equally all over the place. For his career, he was still a 60% passer, which is kind of the baseline that you look for. But 2016 was clearly the shakier of his two seasons when it came to accuracy and keeping himself in rhythm. He also made a lot of bad decisions in critical moments because he just kept resorting to hero ball rather than letting his team do more of the work around him. He tried to do way too much last season, and you could tell that he was really forcing it at the end of games. Whereas in 2015, he leaned more on CJ Procise, Will Fuller, and his extremely talented offensive line to share the load. Above all, his coaching staff at the next level needs to train him to just drive the bus. Stop trying to be Aaron Rodgers and just be Alex Smith first. When everything's in rhythm for him, he's dialed in, he's seeing the full field and delivering the ball on time with good mechanics, I mean, it is fantastic tape. Like number one overall pick kind of tape. But you just don't see those kinds of plays enough yet to make me think he can step in as a rookie and immediately be that guy from day one. His former coach at Notre Dame, Brian Kelly, was absolutely right when he said that Kaiser should have gone back to school and that he wasn't ready. I agree, he isn't ready, which is why I'm putting him in Arizona. He can essentially just do his fourth year of development there with an NFL staff instead of a college staff. And at the end of the day, that's probably what's best for him and his career. He's way too physically gifted for me to reasonably expect him to be available in the second round, so I either take him now at 13 or I don't get him at all. And to be honest, if he went back to school, he probably would have been a contender for first overall next year. So 
To me, this could be a huge value. His upside is definitely worth that risk, especially when I've got a coach in Bruce Arians that I can trust to develop him. Oh, and by the way, spoiler alert, Kaiser is the only quarterback that I have going in the first round. Brad Kaya was close. I really considered putting him late in the first, but I don't have Mitchell Trubisky, I don't have Deshaun Watson, and I don't have Pat Mahomes anywhere in this mock draft. It's, uh, it's just that kind of year for quarterbacks, I guess. In my opinion, you either get Kaiser and sit him on the bench to develop for 2018, or you don't take one in the first round at all. But that's probably just me, I suppose. Anyway, on to pick 14 and the Philadelphia Eagles, who luckily already have their quarterback of the future, so they don't have to reach this year. My one goal going into this draft for Philly was to invest in Carson Wentz in any way possible. Just like with Tennessee and Marcus Mariota, Wentz is my team. We don't go anywhere without him. I need to dedicate myself to giving him the tools to carry the offense. Whether it's running backs, pass catchers, or pass protectors, Wentz needs to be surrounded by talent so that he has the best possible situation in which to develop. With Mike Williams, Corey Davis, OJ Howard, and Leonard Fournette all off the board, I'm torn between a few different options here. Dalvin Cook and Christian McCaffrey are both very tempting, as is Curtis Samuel, but right now I have an even more pressing issue that needs to be addressed, and that's the offensive line. Lane Johnson and Jason Peters are slated as the starters right now, of course, but Johnson's only one bad test away from being suspended for an entire year, and on the other side, Jason Peters is 35 years old and will be 36 at the end of next season. He's probably only got one year left in Philadelphia, so this position has the potential to turn into a gigantic hole on the roster very quickly. For that reason, I'm going with Cam Robinson from Alabama. They do have Big V as the backup right tackle at the moment, but I don't really see him as consistent starter quality on the outside. If anything, I think he's more of a swing guard, whereas Robinson projects as a true starting right tackle with the potential to also play left tackle on day one. I profiled him in depth earlier this spring with his one-on-one -on -one matchup with Miles Garrett, and not only did he hold his own, but he actually dominated Garrett in several individual pass protection opportunities. He did take his lumps every now and then from the first overall pick, but I would say that it was an even battle, which tells me that he can survive a tackle on the next level. Having Robinson on the roster means that I am free as the fake GM of the Eagles to move on from Jason Peters next season. I can move Lane Johnson to the left side, and I can immediately have my right tackle of the future already in place. I don't need to hope for a good right tackle to fall to me in 2018, and I don't have to reach for a much lesser prospect on day two of this 2017 draft. I've got my guy, my quarterback is protected, my depth is now there along the entire line so I can survive the injury bug, and I can move on to getting Wentz weapons in the second and third round this year, where there is still plenty of talent available. To put it succinctly, I would much rather have Cam Robinson and Zay Jones or Cam Robinson and Alvin Kamara as my first and second round package, rather than say, Corey Davis and Taylor Moton. This tackle class is very poor this year, and Robinson is one of the only good ones. So if I have an opportunity to get him and shore up an area on my team that is guaranteed to need an investment at some point in the next two years, then I might as well do it now and take care of the problem before it bites me in the ass. I'm sure there are going to be a lot of Eagles fans that disagree with that line of thinking, but that's just where I'm at right now with them. You can get corners and receivers in the third, fourth, and fifth round that can start immediately, but you definitely cannot say the same about offensive tackle. That's why, to me, Robinson takes priority over every skill position player that's still on the board. Anyway, on to pick 15 and the Indianapolis Colts, hashtag FTC. They've still got some major problems on defense. They brought in a lot of edge rushing talent this year in free agency, but the secondary is still very much in need of an infusion of talent. Boundary corner, other than Vontae Davis, is pretty much a mess, so I'm going to go with Kevin King from Washington at this pick. And keep in mind that I'm not just bumping him up the board simply because his teammate Sidney Jones went down with an Achilles injury. King earned this draft spot all on his own with his own talent. He's big, he's long, he's got surprisingly quick feet and fluid hips for his size, and he's flashed terrific ball skills too as a press and press bail corner. He's not the type of corner that you line up seven yards off the line of scrimmage, pedal, and drive on underneath routes. He needs to be on the line, jamming, and occasionally bailing into those deep third zones in cover three looks. He's similar to Gary and Conley and Marshawn Lattimore in that way, but he's not as polished below the waist as either one of them. That being said, he is arguably more physically gifted than both of them, so his ceiling is incredibly high if the Colts coaching staff can properly mold his athleticism. I think he can really benefit from being in a room with Vontae Davis, who was a similar athlete coming out of college, and he turned into a dominant cornerback once he learned to harness that athleticism with disciplined technique. King will take his lumps early in his career, I can almost guarantee you that. But considering that the Colts have to play against DeAndre Hopkins, Allen Robinson, and now theoretically Mike Williams twice a year, 
They need a big athletic corner that can keep up with all these jump ball receivers. They need someone who can compete with them when the ball's in the air. Smaller corners always have trouble with those 50-50 balls, especially the guys like Hopkins, Robinson, and Williams that all have huge catch radiuses. So King's 6'3 frame and his 39 and a half inch vertical should do wonders for solving that problem. This pick is purely an investment into what I think King can be rather than what he is right now. So just keep that in mind during the early part of his rookie season while he's still kind of figuring out the nuances to playing the boundary in the NFL. This brings us to pick 16, the midpoint of the draft, where the Baltimore Ravens are now on the clock. I'm pretending to be Ozzie Newsom here, and he has a saying along with John Harbaugh that I like to adhere to as a philosophy when I draft for them, and that is play like a raven. They always say this, they love guys that play like a raven. And what they mean by this is they want people who play with attitude. They want toughness, they want aggressiveness, they want players who will play anything and do anything to get a win. They want their team's intensity on the field to be their greatest weapon. And I can think of few players in this draft class who embody that motto more than Michigan's Jabril Peppers. His play speed is incredible, he brings intensity to every tackle, and he will play any position that his coaches ask of him in order to help the team. When you watch him play, regardless of where he's lined up on the field, he has this attitude and this aura about him that just screams Baltimore. At the end of the day, he plays like a raven. And it's no coincidence that he's a product of the Harbaugh coaching family tree with Jim coaching him at Michigan and now John potentially coaching him in Baltimore. He is everything that they look for in a player both on and off the field. While the Ravens may have greater needs from a personnel standpoint like edge rusher, I'm not a huge fan of any of the available edge rushers that are still on the board at this high of a pick. So Peppers to me is the best blend of scheme fit, culture fit, and talent value that I can find for the spot. I see him as a backup safety his first year to Eric Weddle that can also see heavy usage in nickel packages in the slot, but he'll also have a ton of snaps as a punt and kick returner and probably be used a bit on offense as a running back as well. He is such a John Harbaugh kind of player that it would be very hard for me to see him passing on Peppers in the real draft as well unless someone else way high up on their board managed to slide to this spot. For me though, as GM, I think he's a perfect fit. Pick 17 now and Washington is up. They are one of the more interesting teams to draft for because they could go in a ton of different directions. They need help at defensive end, anchor against the run. They could probably use another boundary corner with Bashad Breeland being in the last year of his rookie contract. And there's also talk of potentially moving him to safety. And of course there is the looming cloud of Kirk Cousins and whether or not he's even gonna be on the team next year. They could be eyeing quarterback here early if they feel like the Cousins situation is untenable and they won't be able to keep him. I'm approaching this, however, as if Cousins will be on the team in 2018 and that I'm still trying to build around him as a franchise quarterback. So with that in mind, I'm going with Forrest Lamp from Western Kentucky. He played left tackle for the Hilltoppers in college, but to me, he projects more as a guard. He doesn't really have the feet to play on an island out on the edge, but what he does have is great leverage, great strength, and extremely strong hands. Lamp plays with that nasty edge that fits in with that hog mentality that Washington traditionally looks for in offensive linemen, and that attitude and toughness really shined when he took on Alabama early last year. Keep in mind that when you do prospect evaluations, weighing one tape too heavily can sometimes lead to mistakes if you ignore the larger sample size, but there are some exceptions where that one game is so damn impressive that it forms the entire core of the evaluation. And to me, Lamp's performance against Alabama falls into that category. He dominated the most dominant front seven that college football has seen in a decade. He kicked their ass. This was the number one team in the country where every single player in their front seven is going to be playing in the NFL at one point or another. And he went into their house in Tuscaloosa and he kicked their ass. If Khalil Mack's one game against Ohio State in 2013 got him drafted in the top five, this one game from Lamp against Alabama should get him drafted in the top 20. He consistently drove Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne off the line of scrimmage. Up to that point, nobody had ever done that before. He also locked out Tim Williams rushing off the edge, which almost never happened over the last two seasons. It didn't matter what the tide threw at him, he was ready for it and he handled it beautifully. Again, he's only got 32 and a quarter inch arms and he doesn't have the quickest feet, so he's not built to play tackle. But when he did get his vice grip hands on people, the snap was over. Like that was it. He wasn't letting go and there was nothing they could do to get free. He's just way too strong. As an athlete, he compares very favorably to Zach Martin a few years ago and I think he will have a similar career to Martin in that I think he can be an immediate Pro Bowl caliber guard as a rookie and anchor the interior of that offensive line for years to come opposite Brandon Scherf. 
He is no doubt a better pass protector than Sean LeBow, so to me he's an immediate starter at left guard and will likely stay a starter for the next 10 years. In a draft class that is so devoid of offensive line depth, you could do a hell of a lot worse than that with the 17th overall pick. So Lamp is my guy here, and even though he's not really a sexy pick, it's the smart pick that will pay the most dividends in the future, whether Cousins is here or not. That's what counts. And with that, we welcome back the Titans to this mock draft at 18th overall. We've already added help from Marcus Mariota in the offense with the addition of Mike Williams. So that side of the ball should be pretty much set. The defense could still use some help though, and I'm swinging for the fences to get that help with Michigan State's Malik McDowell. I profiled him back in February, and I still hold the same opinions now that I did then. He is a phenomenal athlete, honestly one of the best physical talents at the five technique position to come out in the last probably five or six years. His combination of length, power, and quickness is exceedingly rare, and the only thing keeping him from being a top 10 or even a top 5 lock is the fact that there are a lot of legitimate questions about his work ethic and coachability. I don't know how successful he can be if he's not in a locker room that can kind of keep him in check and provide him the necessary leadership to develop under. That being said, I consider Tennessee to be one of the stronger locker room environments in the league. I think they have a good coaching staff, they have a lot of really good veterans that can guide McDowell and help him reach his full potential. And believe me, if he does reach his full potential, he can be one of the most disruptive defensive players in the NFL. I'm talking like perennial, all-pro caliber, defensive player of the year kind of disruptive. That's how talented he is. His anchor against the run is damn near immovable. He's flashed dominance as a pass rusher, both inside and on the edge. And when that motor is running hot, there is a very short list of people on this planet that can stop him from getting where he wants to go. He won't be able to reach that potential just anywhere, though. It needs to be the right situation, and the Titans, at least in my opinion, are the right situation. For McDowell's sake, I hope he does end up on a team that has the tools to get the best out of him, because as a fan of the sport, team allegiance aside, I want to see what happens if he reaches that ceiling. If he does put in the work and he does get there, he'll be must-see TV for the next 10 years. Believe that. He is that gifted. So hopefully he gets there. All right, pick 19 and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are now on the clock. Uh, if there's been one common theme throughout this mock draft, it's that if I'm a team with a good young quarterback, my number one priority is to build around him and give him the tools he needs to succeed. When it comes to the Bucs, they do have some good receiving weapons for Jameis Winston, but pass protection has been very shaky for the last two years. DeMar Dotson is okay on the right side, but I do not feel comfortable at all right now with Donovan Smith being my left tackle of the future. I don't think he warranted the second round pick that they spent on him two years ago, and I have yet to see him become the reliable blindside protector that they need him to be. Truthfully, I think he would have more success at guard than tackle, so to me, the best course of action is to move him inside to guard and compete with J.R. Sweezy for that starting spot, and I'm going to draft Garrett Bowles from Utah here at 19th overall to be my new left tackle of the future. Bowles is still a little bit lean at just under 300 pounds, so you wonder if he's got enough meat on the bones to anchor against power rushers, but his athleticism is orders of magnitude better than Donovan Smith. He's got left tackle feet, he's got left tackle length at 34 inch arms, his hip snap and overall fluidity in space is excellent. In terms of keeping up with the pure speed off the edge that the NFC South employs with Vic Beasley, Cam Jordan, and now of course Solomon Thomas, Bowles is the one tackle in this class that I think matches up really well with those types of pass rushers, especially Beasley who's one of the quickest players off the ball in the NFL. Getting a tackle like Bowles, who is supremely athletic, you know, even if he isn't the strongest guy in the world, that's okay with me because he's got the physical skill set to take Beasley out of the game. If you want to win this division, you have to take down Atlanta first, and it's hard to take down Atlanta if you can't keep their best pass rusher in check. Bowles already has the frame to add bulk and add strength, but you can't just add speed and foot quickness out of thin air. You're either born with that or you're not, and Bowles was born with it. I know he's going to be a 25-year-old rookie, which kind of does drop his value a little bit, even though offensive linemen tend to play well into their 30s. However, I will say that he's the key to keeping my young quarterback clean right now. And as long as this team runs through that young quarterback, keeping him clean is priority number one. Because of that, Bowles makes way too much sense here to pass up. One pick later with the Denver Broncos, and they've got the same problem. They also have a young quarterback, well, two young quarterbacks actually, but they also have very poor pass protection on the edges. This is a problem that needs to be fixed, and it needs to be fixed right now. It cannot wait another year, especially if they want to get Paxton Lynch on the field in 2017. 
So I'm taking Ryan Ramchick from Wisconsin. He's not as athletic as Bowles, and of course he is coming off a major surgery, so you wonder how available he's going to be at the start of the season. But he does have good enough feet and technical skill to be a solid pass protector in the NFL. I personally think he's going to be a better right tackle than left tackle, but that's fine because the Broncos need both. My main concern with Ramchick is strength. He's a bit vulnerable to inside counters because he doesn't really have a ton of strength to power step into it with that post foot and drive the defender off his attack angle inside. And when it comes to run blocking, he doesn't really generate movement off the ball. He'll get to his landmarks and he'll seal angles and all that in zone runs, but don't expect him to drive anyone off the line of scrimmage and create a gap for your running back to hit. He's the kind of run blocker where he'll just get in the way and the back is going to have to create the rest themselves. But with this poor tackle class, Ramchick is pretty much the last justifiable option in the first round, and his pass protection is good enough that I can stomach taking him in the top 20 picks. If he hits the weight room and he improves his lower body power, he can be a very, very good tackle in this league. For now though, I think his ceiling is probably somewhere in the middle of the pack of starting offensive tackles, meaning he'll be solid and you won't really be desperate to replace him, so the first round investment will be worth it, but I don't see him ever becoming an elite tackle. Think like a Riley Reef or Ricky Wagner as an example. And just like those two guys, he's honestly more in the mold of the solid right tackle that you put across from the elite left tackle to round out your offensive line. If I were Denver, I'd probably put him on the left side as a rookie simply because they have nobody else. But I would be drafting in the future with the goal of getting a true left tackle so that I could move Ramchick over to the right side permanently. All right, 20 down, 12 to go. Uh, Detroit's up at pick 21, and I'm kind of falling in line with the consensus on this one simply because it's such an obvious match of talent, scheme, and value. We're going with Hassan Reddick from Temple to be the Lions' next dynamic outside linebacker in the post-DeAndre Levy era. Reddick was recruited in high school as a safety, played defensive end in college, and is built like the ideal modern linebacker in the NFL. It's a very unique skill set, and Temple used him all over the field simply because he was experienced enough and athletic enough to do anything they wanted him to do. If they needed him to drop in coverage, he was great at it. If they wanted him to rush the passer, he was ultra explosive off the ball and he could do that too. He was strong enough to work against tight ends as a stack and shed defender if they ran at him, and he was fast enough to run down the ball in pursuit if they ran away from him. Simply put, if you need him to handle any role in the field, he could do it no problem. His best spot in the pros, like I said, is probably at the weak side outside linebacker at a 4-3, known as the wheelbacker. And from there, he can use his speed and explosiveness to just fly to the ball and make play after play after play. He's not the biggest guy in the world, so it's probably not a good idea to put him at a position where he's just banging around with guards all day and holding the point of attack. If that's what you want, there are other linebackers in this class that are better suited for that. But as that will linebacker that is the run and chase role, I think he can have a similar impact on the game that DeAndre Levy did when he was healthy in Detroit. He can erase those super quick receiving backs that give defenses fits, and he can be extremely effective as a blitzer off the edge. Honestly, I would not be shocked to see him have a stat line someday of like 100 tackles in a season, 4 picks, and somewhere between 6 to 8 sacks. He's so naturally gifted and so versatile in his skill set that he could put up monster games and monster seasons just like that without even breaking a sweat. The only reason I don't have him going earlier than this, despite my high expectations for him, is that not a ton of teams really need a true 4-3 outside linebacker. The Bills obviously need one, which is why I had them taking Reuben Foster, who is also a natural 4-3 will, but other than them, I can't really see anyone else specifically targeting that position before the Lions come on the clock at 21. And you know what, that's great news for them because it means that someone as crazy talented as Reddick will likely fall right into their laps. He's the kind of player that can make an average defense good and a good defense great. And if I'm the Lions, I would be stoked to get him this late in the first round. The people who are truly devastated by this pick though are the folks that are picking at 22nd overall in Miami. Reddick has got to be somewhere near the top of their board because they also need an outside linebacker and he fits everything that they like to do scheme wise. But in this scenario, he's now off the board, so I, as the Dolphins GM, have to adjust to that and try to salvage the situation. Oh, and I should also probably mention that my other top choices for Miami are Forrest Lamp and Eddie Jackson, who are also both off the board. So I'm kind of digging a bit deeper down the wish list for this one. In the end, though, I decided that I'm going to go with Taco Charlton from Michigan. The Dolphins can go a ton of different directions here, whether it be guard or center fielding free safety, or of course linebacker, but they also really need depth at defensive end as well. Cameron Wake is ancient in pass rushing years. He's 35, and he's not going to last much longer. William Hayes on the other side isn't much younger either. He's about to turn 32. 
Behind them, you've got Andre Branch and Terrence Fade. So this depth chart really doesn't inspire a whole lot of confidence in me that they are set at the position for the future. So Charlton's my pick because I think of all the remaining defensive ends on the board, he has one of the highest ceilings along with Jordan Willis. He's got great size at 6'6", 270, and great length with 34 and a quarter inch arms. He's not the twitchiest pass rusher out there, but to me, as long as you have one or two really good traits that you can build around, Charlton's of course being size and length, then you can be a productive pass rusher in the NFL. He already uses those traits to be a great edge run defender on the line of scrimmage. He just needs to learn how to harness them and turn it into production against the pass. I think of all those veterans in the D-line room there in Miami, Wake, Hayes, and Dominic Sue, of course, and they can all help him learn to use his gifts to get to that level eventually. It might not be in 2017, but in 2018 and beyond, I think he's going to start putting up numbers. He reminds me a lot of Carlos Dunlap in that way, and honestly, they're almost the exact same profile coming out of college. Eventually, Dunlap learned to use his length and power and turn those traits into production, and he's gone to the Pro Bowl the last two years as a result. So while it would have been nice to get Reddick for the Dolphins here, I'm perfectly okay with a high upside edge rusher as my consolation prize. Worst case scenario, he's a capable base end in a 4-3 that sets the tone against the run while being a contributor on third down, but best case scenario, he's a fantastic run defender who also gets double digit sacks year in and year out. You don't know for sure that he can get to that level, but I feel pretty good about his chances, and to me it's worth a shot in the first round. Now, moving on to the Giants at 23, I, I just want to first say that I have no earthly idea what the hell is going to happen with this Eli Manning memorabilia fraud story stuff. It could be nothing, but it could be devastating. I'm not going to touch it in this video because I don't have any facts to back anything up as of the time of me recording this, so until I do, I'm just going to ignore it and proceed as if there is nothing wrong and that we expect Eli to be on the field next season. So, all that being said, as the Giants general manager, I'm going to give Eli yet another weapon to play with in David Njoku from Miami. He is nowhere near as refined in any phase of the game as OJ Howard, but he is supremely athletic and has immense upside if he can develop properly. I don't like that he's a bit of a body catcher, but I never noticed any sort of drop problems of any kind, so I'll let that slide for now. I just want him to get better at extending those arms out and actually catching the ball rather than trapping it against his pads, but that's really just a minor thing. Njoku is extremely explosive in and out of his breaks for a guy his size, and that huge 37 and a half inch vertical shows up in the red zone where he was Brad Kaya's go-to weapon. Again, he's not a polished route runner yet, but with how he's able to sink his hips and change direction so quickly and so fluidly, I think he's got the tools to get that polish eventually. And if he does get to that level of polish, oh man, is he going to be dangerous. With his size, speed, and explosiveness, he is a yards after catch nightmare in the open field after he gets that separation. I talked about OJ Howard earlier and how impressive he was as a prospect, and to me, Njoku is just an undeveloped version of Howard. Meaning with proper coaching and dedication to his craft, he can eventually get to Howard's level. It's just going to take some time. That's why he's going 23rd overall and not 2nd overall. But working with a veteran quarterback like Eli Manning should be good for him and his development. Eli is known for working with his receivers to perfect every detail of every route, so he should be in good hands in New York. Assuming Manning isn't suspended for any crazy and as of yet unsubstantiated scandals, of course. But anyway, I digress. Let's just move on to pick 24 in the Oakland Raiders. For a long time, I had Zach Cunningham from Vanderbilt slated to the Raiders because they have a huge, huge need at the Mike linebacker position, and he's the best pure Mike backer in this class. But as I look back on my board, one name really stuck out like a sore thumb because he hadn't been picked yet, and that's Jonathan Allen from Alabama. He is a better player than the 24th overall spot in this class, but I just couldn't find a place for him until now. I think he's a natural fit at the three technique in the Raiders defense, and he gives them a much needed boost to their interior run defense. He may not be super twitchy as a pass rusher, but his hand usage and his power is so damn good that I think he can be a great contributor on third downs as well. With Khalil Mack, Mario Edwards, and Bruce Irvin already in the building, Allen gives Oakland that final piece to the puzzle that can turn a dangerous front line into a ridiculously dangerous front line. He can two-gap inside on a guard and cover for mistakes from the linebackers. He can push the pocket and prevent quarterbacks from stepping up away from Mack and Edwards coming off the edge. And of course, if given the opportunity, he can provide some penetration of his own to get a few sacks himself. He's just a very, very well-coached, pro-ready defensive tackle that has more impact on the game than his actual stat sheet. In my opinion, whether Cunningham is available or not, getting that kind of steady, reliable defensive lineman is a bigger priority than a Mike linebacker. Especially if you want to build your defense from the inside out like most teams at least try to do these days. 
In fact, if you look at the team picking one spot later at 25 in Houston, they already have built their defense from the inside out. Their line is set for years. They've already got J.J. Watt, Jadavian Clowney, and D.J. Reader. They've got Whitney Merciless coming off the edge and Bernard McKinney patrolling the middle. Like top to bottom, they are locked and loaded in that front seven. What the Texans defense lacks though is a really reliable nickel defender. Kareem Jackson used to be a reliable slot corner, but his play has taken a dip lately as he's gotten closer to 30, so there's talk of moving him to safety this offseason. Houston also needs another safety to pair with Andre Howell anyway, so that move makes sense. Jackson was kind of their Achilles heel last season in the secondary when he was in the slot, so whether they draft a corner or a safety, something's going to have to be done to address the nickel position either way. Enter Buda Baker from Washington, who ever since his freshman year has both been a great safety on the back end and a superb slot defender. Honestly, I'd venture to say that he is just as good of a slot defender as Jabril Peppers, if not better, but he's a bit smaller than Peppers and he doesn't bring the same versatility on special teams and offense, which is why I have him going after Peppers in this mock. That being said, Baker's quickness in and out of breaks is just absolutely insane. I mean, he changes direction faster than maybe any other defensive back in this class at any position. These little double releases from the slot, all the shake and bake that smaller receivers try to do to get free, I mean, it just straight up does not work against him. He's too quick and nobody can get away from him. And if you do happen to get a slight window and you try to target him, do it at your own peril because he can make up the ground in a hurry and take that ball away. And that's not even my favorite part of his skill set, which is his attitude as a tackler against both the run and the short passing game. Truth be told, I'm not even sure if he's aware of how small he is because he comes downhill and he throws his body into contact like he weighs 250 pounds. Like, I say this with 100% certainty. Buda Baker does not give a single shit how big you are or how strong you are. He's going to put you on the ground anyway. I love that attitude. I love that willingness to hit. With the slot defender having such an important role against the run in the Romeo Cornell defense, you need whoever is playing that position to have that intensity against the run. They need to love contact. They need to love the aggression that the nickel position requires in that scheme. That intensity is Buda Baker to a T. In fact, when I watch him play, the only thing I can think of is Tyron Matthew. His quickness, his size, or lack of size really, his instincts, his play style. I mean, he literally is everything that Matthew is for the Cardinals. So clearly, at least to me, it's a huge value for Houston at a huge position of need, and I think he would be a perfect fit in this scenario considering who is left on the board. Now, going from a Washington star player to the NFL team that plays in Washington, that brings us to the 26th pick and the Seattle Seahawks. You know, I gotta say, the, the offensive line situation on this roster is just shameful at this point. They've brought in project after project and athlete after athlete trying to mold them all into an acceptable lineman, and I'm just tired of it. Tom Cable isn't able to do it. He can't take all this crap and turn it into gold after years of trying, so I'm over it. That approach ends right now. I'm taking Dan Feeney from Indiana because even though he doesn't project as an elite guard at the next level like Forrest Lamp, he does project as a guard that can start for a long time and not be a liability. He's that classic safe interior line prospect where the floor and the ceiling are basically the same thing, which to me is still an upgrade over what the Seahawks are trotting out there right now. He also works better as a zone run blocker than a pure gap scheme mauler, which works in Seattle's favor because they tend to run a lot more zone plays in the run game than they do gap scheme plays anyway. Whether or not he's athletic enough to have that ultra high ceiling is irrelevant to me because right now all Russell Wilson really needs is just a guard with a floor that isn't so low that it might as well be halfway to the Earth's core. No more projects, okay? No more entirely preventable sacks. Feeney is my guy. All right, 27th pick and the Chiefs are now up. I'm going with Zach Cunningham to be their Mike linebacker of the future. I alluded to this pick a little bit in my full length breakdown of Cunningham a couple weeks ago but they really need to find a long-term replacement for Derek Johnson as his career winds down. Cunningham is an extremely long, extremely slippery middle linebacker that has a knack for working off of blocks and dominating against the interior run game. He isn't the fastest linebacker from sideline to sideline, but with so many great edge protectors already on the roster, you look at Eric Berry, Justin Houston, Tom Bahali, and D. Ford, he doesn't really need to have true sideline to sideline speed because everything's gonna be forced back inside to him anyway. In that scenario where he can just focus on wrecking the interior run game and trusting his edge defenders to do their jobs, I truly think he could compete for the league lead in tackles every single year. 
He's the best pure Mike backer in this class, and from a talent value and scheme fit perspective, very few teams are better situations for Cunningham's skill set than Kansas City. If he winds up playing an arrowhead, he's going to stay there for a very, very long time, which is what you hope for out of your first round pick. That brings us to pick 28 and the suddenly resurgent Dallas Cowboys. They just lost Barry Church in free agency to the Jaguars, and in my opinion, that was actually a really underrated hit to their roster. Their starting strong safety right now is projected to be Jeff Heath, who has been a backup caliber player and a special teamer for his entire career. I don't really feel very comfortable with that, considering that I'm going to have to play against Zach Ertz, Jordan Reed, and now Dave Njoku twice a year each. The NFC East is quietly loaded with a lot of great athletes at the tight end position, and I need size and athleticism in my secondary to try to keep all of them in check. So I'm going back to the trusty Yukon Well to pair Obi Melifonwu with Byron Jones for the second time in their respective careers. And just like Jones, I think Obi has the physical skill set to play either corner or safety in the NFL. For his size, he's 6'4", 235 pounds, by the way, he's got phenomenally quick feet, he's got fluid hips, and unlike most people his size, he can actually pedal and drive on underneath throws. Keep in mind that he's basically the same dimensions as Zach Cunningham, a middle linebacker, but he put up better testing numbers than almost every other defensive back at the Combine since, uh, well, basically ever. <laughs> From a technical and mental development perspective, he's still, of course, a little bit raw, but his physical gifts are so off the charts that I think with his baseline footwork and fluidity, he's still more than capable of locking up receivers and man coverage. Hell, his best spot on day one might actually be a corner simply because he's so good in man. Tying into that a little bit, my main complaint with Melifonwu, and this is why he's going late first round instead of being a top 10 lock, is that he's a bit slow to trigger at times. I feel like he played faster and smoother when he was in man coverage because the assignment didn't really require a lot of pre and post snap reading. That assignment was literally just to erase someone in coverage and make sure they weren't targeted, which he did very well. If he was in more of a zone look on the back end and he had to read his keys and make quick decisions on where to be, that's where I think he slowed down a little bit and sometimes got himself into trouble. The snaps where he did read his keys quickly and play decisively, I mean it was special, special kind of tape. But the problem is that he didn't always read things that quickly. If his coaches at the next level kind of quicken his processor and get him playing more decisively as a safety, then his athleticism and man coverage ability could make him a perennial pro bowler and one of the anchors to that Cowboys defense. If they can't get him to that point though, his best spot will probably be at corner instead where the reads are easier and he can just play as fast as possible. He's such a good athlete that I think he'll be successful either way. I mean, like worst case scenario, he just gets converted into a big bodied corner that can match up with guys like Brandon Marshall and Alshon Jeffrey in that division. But best case scenario, he can stick at safety alongside Byron Jones and round out one of the most devastatingly athletic tandems in the history of the sport. We'll see what happens with him as he develops, but no matter what, he is very much worth the pick with that kind of upside. Moving on to pick 29 in the Green Bay Packers, you know, when I look at this roster, they are ready to compete for a Super Bowl right now. But I don't know if they're going to be able to get back there if they keep having their defense completely crumble in the playoffs. They gave up 44 points to Atlanta in the NFC Championship game, which I realize the Falcons were a historically effective offense and all that, but still, almost allowing a 50-burger is just not acceptable if you have championship aspirations. They couldn't stop the edge run game. They couldn't get home to Matt Ryan. I mean, the front seven just, they completely collapsed. It was horrible. And what's worse is that when you pick this late in the first round every single year, it's not like there's a ton of edge talent that usually sticks around at this point in the draft. It's kind of a lose-lose in most cases. However, I do have one guy in mind for this pick that I think does have a decent chance of being there at 29 in the actual draft. And in this mock draft, he is luckily still sitting there waiting for me to take him, and that's TJ Watt from Wisconsin. I think if he is on the board, he stays in America's cheese factory and he balls out for his hometown team. He finally had that breakout performance for the Badgers in 2016 that we've all kind of been waiting for since he was converted to the linebacker, and I think he showed that he can be an NFL caliber edge rusher. He's got an excellent combination of size and refined technique, which is to be expected from that family, I guess, and really his only physical flaw that you could point to would be that he has average arm length rather than the literal tree trunks for arms that Big Brother has down in Houston. But for a 3-4 outside linebacker, I mean, he's got almost everything you want physically. He plays extremely hard, he plays that disciplined brand of Wisconsin football, and I believe he's a guy that you can count on to always be in the right place to make a play. I don't think that his explosive numbers at the Combine showed up as much on tape as I hoped they would, but he's still a good athlete. 
To me, he just wins more with power and technique than he does with raw speed and explosiveness, which is fine because at least he's still got some traits to build around. That being said, however, keep in mind that he is going to get better than he is right now, even though he's already pretty damn good. TJ is going to be working out with JJ every single offseason, you can almost guarantee that. And no matter what your physical talent is, if you're working out with arguably the best pass rusher of the last decade every single summer, you're probably going to pick up some things and become a better player yourself. Remember, every single elite pass rusher in the NFL is elite because they package good technique with their athleticism, and that includes JJ Watt. So as long as TJ's technique keeps improving under the mentorship of his brother, he'll be a great contributor off the edge. With Watt now off the board though, I just kind of screwed myself at pick 30 with the Pittsburgh Steelers. I also need an edge rusher at this pick, and unfortunately for me, the edge rushing pool is getting really, really thin this late in the first round. Everyone who might fit in this range, Tim Williams, Jordan Willis, Derek Barnett, Charles Harris, Tack McKinley, they've all got warts. None of them are perfect prospects for a variety of different reasons, and all of them are going to need a bit of luck to get taken in the first round. But as it relates to the Steelers, the one that I feel the most comfortable gambling on is probably Tim Williams. And with Williams, I realize that yes, it is a massive, massive gamble. Especially with the other names on the list that you know are probably not in danger of getting suspended for drug problems at any given moment. However, I think Williams is such a better fit than all of them skill set wise that I think he's worth the risk here. The Steelers window is closing. Ben Roethlisberger is already thinking about retirement. James Harrison probably isn't far behind him. Le'Veon Bell may or may not only be in town for one more season, and Martavis Bryant is one bad test away from being straight up kicked out of the league. Pittsburgh's season is already resting on a razor's edge, and it's only April. But it's also undeniable that if nobody retires, gets injured, or suspended between now and September, they might just be the most dangerous team in the NFL. Tim Williams, to me, is the last immediate impact pass rusher left in this class that can stand up in a 3-4. And if I, as the GM, want my team to be able to make one last serious run at a ring, I need to bring in an immediate impact pass rusher right now. I don't have the luxury to wait. Williams is the last guy that I can look for to potentially get 8-10 to 10 sacks as a rookie edge rusher. If he keeps his nose clean and stays away from drugs, hopefully learning from the mistakes of his teammates of course, I think he will be a huge steal. I know that his combine testing numbers were pedestrian, but if I look at the test results and I look at the tape, I see the exact opposite of TJ Watt, meaning he plays faster on tape than he tests. His burst off the ball in pads is way better than his 33 and a half inch vertical in shorts, I can tell you that much. Is he a bit stiff in the hips? Yeah, I'd agree with that. But his first step quickness, hand usage, and his real knack for wicked inside counter moves should make him a very dangerous pass rusher across from Bud Dupree. At the end of the day, the Steelers have needed more production off the edge for seemingly the last five or six years, and until that problem goes away, all I can do is just keep drafting these high ceiling pass rushers until a few of them actually stick. Hopefully for Williams' sake, he keeps himself out of trouble because I do think he has a very good chance of being one of the edge prospects in this class that does stick. And speaking of teams that still need pass rush help to put them over the top in their chase for a Super Bowl win, that brings me to the next pick with the Atlanta Falcons at 31 overall. I'm going with the aforementioned Jordan Willis here because I think he's a pure hand in the dirt defensive end in a 4-3 that fits what the Falcons coaching staff looks for in their hybrid 4-3 front. They want speed and explosiveness above all else and Willis certainly fits that bill as a 6-4, 260-pound defensive end that boasts a 39-inch vertical and a blazing, blazing fast 6-8-5 three-cone drill time. Unfortunately though, despite his crazy athleticism showing up on tape on a weekly basis, I don't think he ever really put up the monster numbers he was capable of because his hand usage is still very raw. But man, if the Falcons coaches can harness that athleticism and develop him, he could be extremely productive. I mean, he was already a force off the edge as it is simply because of his physical gifts. But if you combine that with good hand placement, good timing in his punches, and knowing how and when to throw counter moves, that's a really tall order for any offensive tackle to try to stop. Just like Taco Charlton a bit earlier, it will take Willis some time to actually reach his potential, but the extremely high ceiling of that potential is what makes this pick worth it. Okay, one pick left. We are almost at the finish line, I promise. The New Orleans Saints are back on the clock with the 32nd overall pick and the final pick of this mock draft. With my first first rounder, I took Gary and Conley at the 11th overall pick to start a total overhaul of this cornerback depth chart. And with my second first rounder, I'm going to complete that overhaul with Tredavious White. I do realize that defensive end is still a huge need for this team, but 
I have a very hard time justifying taking Derek Barnett, Charles Harris, or Tack McKinley here. Based on my own grades for them, not one of them are close to being worth this pick, but Tredavious White is. As I said earlier, none of the Saints top three corners can stay healthy, and other than Delvin Bro, I don't really consider any of them to be definitively above replacement level. Why should I not turn one of the biggest weak points on the roster into one of the biggest strengths? Is it so terrible to have three really good starting corners? I don't think so. You can never ever have enough good corners, and that goes double when your current starting corners can't stay healthy. So to me, Tredavious White makes sense because he improves the depth yet again of one of the most important position groups on the team, and by his own merits, I think he is a more legitimate first round prospect than all the other edge talents that are still on the board. I broke him down in depth last month if you want to see my full thoughts on him, but the quick version is that he is a very clean corner from the technical perspective. His feet are great, he uses his hands like an NFL veteran, he's got return ability, he was a leader in the locker room, and basically I think he can step in day one as your starting nickelback and keep that job for the next 10 years. He's not overly explosive and his long speed's fairly average, but his lateral quickness and hip fluidity are so good that he projects to be a very capable slot defender. I think that if I'm the Saints defensive coordinator, I would love to put White in the slot, you put Conley and Bro on the outside, and I would roll into 2017 with an entirely new secondary that maybe, just maybe, actually has a shot at slowing down Atlanta. They will have their growing pains like any other young secondary player will, but I like Conley and White's chances to be successful NFL players in the long term a hell of a lot better than most other players in this class. I already know a lot of Saints fans are going to be mad at me for taking two corners when defensive end is still such a huge need, but based on my grades for everyone that was left on the board, this really is the best option by far. I just could not pass up on White here, so he's my pick. Alright, finally after all that, here are the complete results of the first annual Film Room Mock Draft Special. I hope that I was able to adequately explain my philosophy behind each and every pick. And of course, you can check out my full length breakdowns on a big chunk of these first rounders to get more detailed thoughts on their skill sets and their fits in the league. I don't expect this mock draft to be accurate in terms of predicting what will actually happen on draft night, but I do hope that it at least conveyed my thoughts on this class as a whole and how I value a lot of these players relative to each other. We'll come back and break down this mock in a year or two once all these guys actually get some real action under their belt, and we'll see how my grades for them compare to their tangible results on the field. With any luck, I won't have any completely painful and devastating misses like I did with Brock Osweiler last year. Yeah, that one, uh, that one still kind of hurts a little bit, but uh, whatever, nobody bats a thousand, I guess. Anyway, on the screen are some of the notable names left out of this mock draft. Just be aware that I do expect most of these guys to get drafted in the first round in the real draft, especially Christian McCaffrey, Dalvin Cook, Curtis Samuel, Mitch Trubisky, and Deshaun Watson, but I just couldn't find a spot for any of them. I have first round grades on McCaffrey, Cook, and Samuel in particular, and I was considering all of them as early as the Eagles at 14 overall, but for whatever reason, for every single pick in this round, there was just always somebody else that I wanted more than them. That's not an indictment on their talent, I think they are all going to be very good NFL players, but sometimes slides like that happen for reasons out of anyone's control, and that's how you end up with teams at the top of the second round that get crazy good values. I'll tell you right now, all these guys that were left out of my mock draft, not all of them are going to get taken on the first day. Most of them will, yes, but like this mock draft showed, not all of them can be. This class is too deep for everyone to fit in the first round, so if I'm a Browns, Niners, Jags, Bears, or Rams fan that all have picks early in day two, I'm pretty stoked right now because I know at least one great player is going to fall into that range. In short, this was a very good year to be a very bad football team. That's some uh, silver linings for those teams, I guess. Now let's pay some bills, shall we? Everyone on your screen here are this week's newest Patreon supporters that have opened their wallets to help support the channel and keep it running. I spent a lot of all-nighters over the last two weeks trying to put together this mock draft video for every one of you that signed up to donate to the channel. It's been easily the most challenging episode I've ever done, and of course the longest episode I've ever done. But it was worth it because at the end of the day, I'm here to give you guys the content that you want to see. You all wanted to see a mock draft, and hopefully you enjoyed watching this as much as I enjoyed making it. It has truly been a pleasure getting all of you ready for the 2017 NFL Drafts, and I will see you all again right after the draft to analyze all the picks and give you my opinions on what it means for next season. And of course, you can follow me live on Twitter during the draft. I'll be giving my snap reactions to every single pick and what it all means for the league. For the longer breakdowns, you can expect those post-draft reactions shortly after the dust kind of settles, and I can collect my thoughts and get those videos done. So, until we meet again after the draft, later. Later.